David Butts. I live on Long Island and I have been singing for a number of years. Uh, I started singing when I was in Minneapolis at St. Mary's Cathedral and uh, then started working with my choir director. And she said, You want to be my right hand and my left hand? Mm -hmm. What do you mean? And she's like, Well, I'll teach you how to thread. So uh, that was about 23 years ago. I moved to New York and I had the under and with public a little bit, and then got a sip of him and be a sponge and soak up all sorts of information. And then from there I began taking classes at St. Vlad's and conducting, starting with the basics and then moving up to the composition course. And then about two years ago, what seemed like it was sort of a fluke, uh, I got an email from Doreen Bartholk, who was one of the chairs of the Diocesan the Music Commission for the Diocese of New York, New Jersey, the ACA, saying, you're good with kids, can you work with a workshop for us? And so the rest is sort of history, because I said, well, what do you want? I didn't say yes, I said, what do you want? And she said, well, put something together, we want to be able to teach kids how to sell and get involved, because we see a need there, people are asking for work. And so, fruit of those emails was basically putting together some lessons and ideas. I'm not going to go over them per se, I'm going to sort of do more of a broad spectrum look and perspective like that. But I do have some resources here, and the composition, some of the compositions that I've done were based on the situation that I found myself in. And what that means is that at the OC Chancery, it was pretty much my wife, myself, Father Sergei, a couple other people, and depending on which weeks we're traveling or in town, we either have a lot of bases in the tenor or a lot of tenors at a base or just myself. So it kind of sounds like a normal pair of choir, I guess. Um, but so the settings that I would do would be based on. And so we're going to talk about here today. And if you have questions along the way, certainly feel free to interrupt. I know we only have about an hour left. We can stretch that to maybe a couple minutes after if need be. So thank you for showing an interest. And actually, I want to begin first with how many of you today actually currently work with kids? Raise your hand. Okay. And who develops the resources for those programs that you use? I do. Okay. And are you pleased with the resources that you do use? I'm sorry? Are you pleased with the resources that you use? Well, I create them, so yeah. <laughs> I'm okay with it. They're fabulous. Okay. So it's, it's sort of a loaded question, but it sort of gets, it gets to the point really quickly, which is there is a sort of an absence of resources. So I think one thing that we could do collectively as we're thinking about this topic today is think about ways that we can pool our resources and work together. Instead of having 47 people reinventing the wheel, sort of find some baseline things so that way we can work together and say, okay, well this worked here, this didn't work here, and we can work from that. So how many of you want to work with kids? Okay. And for those of you who don't want to work with kids, have you thought about what this means for your parish's future? Because if you don't want to work with kids, then why should we be here in church anymore? Because the kids aren't our future, the kids are our present. And what that means really is that they need to be singing with us now, not so that they can be the future, but so that they can sing with us now, learn what we've learned from our parents, our grandparents, our co altos and co bases and everything else, so that they can then learn from each other and instill that in other people. Because eventually they're going to want to get married. They're probably going to want to do something with their lives besides singing the choir or besides standing with their parents. And if we don't take some initiative now to get them to stand with us or to be at least inclined to sing with us in church and to sing at home or to have some sort of prayer life at home, then what's the point we might go home right now? Or at least go down to Apple. Um, I ask some questions also, though, because I have uh, I have something that I need to share with you. Um, I have shatteritis. You probably have never heard of this. It's, it's not fatal, it's not contagious, don't worry, but it can be debilitating. <laughs> See, William Shatner played a really cool role on TV in the 60s, okay, Captain Kirk. But the problem is, he got pegged for that role, and he never could get out of it. I don't want to be pegged as the guy that works with kids because it's something that we should all be doing. <laughs> so, 
no chaperones, okay? <laughs> all right, but we can work together. We got to listen to the experts, okay? And the experts say that we need. You thought it was the Saint John Chrysostom, right? So, yeah. But here's here's the thing. I mean, what did she say? Don't patronize kids. Oh, we've got kids, so we've got to do something. How many times have we gone visiting to other churches during the summer or even just on a weekend and you go up and it's like, can I sing? Sure, what part do you sing? Like you already see their eyes light up, it's like, ooh, I got a new bass. <laughs> and it's like, you know, I'm only visiting, oh. Like so it goes from like they're excited to have you and then it goes right up the window. So the idea is we gotta do that with kids as well. Be nice to them, welcome into our community, welcome them into into our setting, whether it's on the clerosis and the part of law, where it's with all the people, so that they feel comfortable, so that they can adopt it themselves. Okay? So this requires us to thoughtfully reflect on what we can do in order to make that connection. Because every child and every parish community is unique. And so what I'm going to share with you may or may not be applicable to your parish. It may or may not even work with your kids. But at least it's something that may spark some curiosity, some interest, or some ideas, so that way we can then pool our resources, as I was saying, so that we can say, hey, this works here, you know, let's try this here. <clears throat> so, the other thing is that the goal today is, with the choir, are very simple. We need to provide spiritual nourishment and spiritual knowledge for the members of our choir. Not just your kids, whether they be old, young, new, veteran, uh, give them a situation where they can give them an experience to take for a moment and potentially help their desire to make sure it's a regular part of their life. The reality is, kids have lots of stuff going on in their lives and so do parents. And as a parent, I'm not here to say that we've got to add more stuff to our schedule. So when you start looking at all the different things that they've got going on, whether it's sports, or friends, or going to the movies, or their music lessons, or their dance lessons, or whatever else, how are we going to pack anything in? And how many times have you seen in your own parishes where on, on Costco, everybody's full of that joy and all of that excitement. And if they don't go to church on bright Monday or bright Tuesday, and they slip right back to the school and work, but by the Sunday you say, Christ is risen, they're like, oh yeah, that's right. <laughs> and it takes effort, almost as much effort to have that joy for Costco to continue as it does to go up to that person and ask for forgiveness on forgiveness festivals. And then to go to the pre sanctioned one. But we make that effort during Lent, right? How many of us here? Go to pre sanctifies on Wednesday and make office on Friday, or maybe the memorial liturgy on Saturday, in addition to the vigil on Saturday and liturgy on Sunday. I mean, that's most of us, right? So during the rest of the year, we may have not as many services and don't have to fast as often or as much as we do during Lent, but maybe if we sort of carve out a little bit of time during the rest of the year and say, okay, Thursday night, I'm going to spend two hours and I'm going to work on it. Or we block out, you know, we block out time for must-see TV on NBC. Well, let's block out Wednesday evening for must-see choir. Or I'm going to give a call. I'm going to Skype somebody. We're going to work on this together, so that you can actually put together some sort of methodology. Because then parents are going to see, oh, they're making a concerted effort on this. They may not appreciate it, or they may not even know how many hours you're putting into it. But at least you're making that commitment that's going to help your efforts. As a choir director, as a singer, if you're, who here is not a choir director? Okay. So you could very easily go to your partner and say, hey, I don't know anything about it, but I want to help out, but here's what I want to do. And they'll say, hey, what did you do in Kentucky? <laughs> <laughs> Why do you want to do that? that? Don't be surprised if you get that reaction. You know? Because how many, again, how many people did not raise their hands that they don't want to work with kids? It's not a judgment. I'm not, I'm, I'm not here to judge you, okay? I'm just saying, it's a natural reaction not to think about, oh, we've got to do something for kids. Or, I guess, <laughs> the best way to describe it is a joke, okay? Um, the Pope is sitting there with the Holy Synod, and they're all sort of like a couple of the cardinals are asleep, and the Pope is working on his next statement from out on the veranda, and one of the Swiss guard bursts in, oh, Your Holiness! Jesus Christ just walked into the St. Peter's Square, what do we do? He looks at the cardinals and the cardinals get all scared and he's like, okay, everybody look a busy. 
you know, that's, it's not about looking busy, it's about, let's do something, don't rush into it, but like, think about what we're doing, like, take the initiative and take that first step. Why? Because kids have a sense of wonder and awe. You remember the moment when you saw a kid in church look like that? Because the demon was sensing, or because the priest came out with gifts for the great entrance? Or that first time that you walked into an Orthodox church, or you were a little kid and you looked up and it's like, oh, what is this? Where am I? Like, I, you know, I clearly remember the first time I was in Pasca. You know, it it was an unmoving moment and the church was completely dark and all I could see were a lot of people's backs. But when I looked up and I saw the top of the dome, and then 20 minutes later, all the lights were on and we're walking around outside and it's cold. I'll definitely remember that moment. And so think of those moments, and think of those situations where you had serenity, your peace, that were all inspiring, and try to help people in your choir find those moments, and to keep them, so that we can keep that possible joy alive. You know, Christ died for us on the cross, and now he's risen. And if we carry that idea forward in everything that we do, we're going to help our kids grow. But the question is, do they grow as much in church as they do outside? I have an 11-year-old and a 6-year-old. And we make sure that they get the best education because education is very important. You're not going to be looking anywhere. Reality, do we do the same thing in church? Like, what do our kids need to know at this age versus this age versus this age versus this age versus this age? Versus this age? There's a great book out there, and if you don't have it, buy it. Okay, it's from St. Vlad's, it's republished, it's just outstanding. You can't get more information into one book, you know, into these pages. It's as good as the Chesterfield book on how to conduct. You know, those two packages. Yes? Oh, sorry, sorry, sorry. Let's see. There you go. Our, children, our Church and Our Children. It's by Sophie Salunzi. And it is good in so many ways because it has statements like this. We need to make our faith practical and applicable for everything that kids do. So when you go off and you buy the Chesterfield book from Musica Rusica Sam, and it tells you how to direct and why to direct and all of those elements that go with it, then go home, buy this from St. Vlad's, sbspress.org, and I don't get any kickbacks, so just help the seminary. Um, but read the two. And the reason you want to read the two is because of statements like this, and because of all sorts of other pages that I've highlighted as, as I've gone through it and reread it and everything else. So, what can we do to provide that more meaningful and tangible experience that inspires people and kids in particular to be more involved? It's that education element. But it also means we need to know the basics of how to keep kids in church and to review them because it's part of our regular interaction. Same thing is not going to work every day. You know, to sort of change depending on the habits. One day, Tatiana may come home really happy because she just ate her French quiz. The next day, she may come home totally miserable because she didn't get a hit in softball. Well, <laughs> the two are not synonymous. <laughs> but, you know, you still got to treat them with the same love and care and respect. And I know I'm preaching to the choir, but it's, it's those same elements that you use at home that transfer into church, so that when you're talking to kids and when you're working with kids, you're going to sort of hopefully show that you're stable, that you're constant, and that no matter how they fluctuate up or down, you're always there. So what can we do? Well, we can be loving, we can be open and inviting, we don't hover, okay? Like I said, you come into church, ooh, we got new bass, and it's like, well, yeah, I'm only here for vespers. I'm not coming to the liturgy. I'm going to another church tomorrow and have the same exact experience, you know. Mm -hmm. But you got to be careful with kids as well, because if they decide to show up and they want to try it out on their own, which is a blessing in itself, then say, great. Where, what part do you sit? If they know, okay, why don't you stand over here? Because kids can probably be safe with surprises and all. But sort of give them a buddy. Here, you stand by Mrs. Jones because Mrs. Jones is, you know, she knows what to do. Um, be self-deprecating. It works because it shows that you're not stuffy. It shows that you are 
okay with yourself. If you're comfortable with yourself, that means you're going to be comfortable with who they are. Welcome them. How many times have you come up into the choir loft and the antithesis of, oh, the singer is, what are you doing here? You know, I can understand and I can appreciate as a director and as a singer that you don't know this person from Adam and you don't know how they're going to sing or if they're going to know the music. So it is something to be worried about. But more importantly, if you're showing Christian love, there are ways to say, have you sung before? Where do you sing normally? Take a couple seconds and get to know who they are. You may end up with a really good ringer that is moving to town and does want to sing on a regular basis and then you can say, ooh, I got a new member, possibly. You know? so, Different ways to think about it. This is another great quote from the Kulumzi quote. And the reason that I have this one here is because when you've identified kids that are interested in singing and that they want to sing more than just by standing with their parents, you've got to explore their level of interest. It may mean talking to the parents, it may mean talking to the kids, it may mean that you take an interest in who they are and what they like to do. It also may mean that you have to be cognizant of the fact that they may be in soccer or they may have ballet or something else going on. And if they're willing to make this type of commitment just to come to church on a Sunday, be grateful for that. Because the teenager that actually wants to come to church and wants to sing is very special. And unfortunately today is probably pretty rare. So we have fertile ground for them to be able to come and participate and come out of the choir loft and say, yeah, I want to come back next week to their friends. And then to you, walk into the clear rose and walk into the choir loft next week and just by showing up, they've shown that to you. And then thank God. Prayer is always important, as Father said in there. You know, if we pray, God will take care of the rest. We're just here to nurture the soil and water it and throw the seeds out there. He'll take care of the sunshine. But we do have that pastoral responsibility to encourage an active community to extend beyond the wall of the church on Sunday morning. So it's always good to speak to the priest and make sure that you're on the same page, that you know what you're doing. And if you're not a choir director, that's okay. You know, talk to the choir director or talk to the priest and say, Hey, Father, I want to help try to like, get some younger kids into the choir. Now, why would you do that? Because as you're going on for communion on Sunday, you happen to hear a couple people <coughs> in the congregation singing, or you happen to see a couple of kids as you're walking into church, like, paying attention. You may see somebody and say, hey, did you see Joey over there? He was singing today. Yeah, he's doing really well, too. Do you want me to talk to him, or do you want to talk to him? So be that catalyst, be that initiator to sort of take things to the next level. Because it's very easy to say, oh, I praise her in the liturgy, but where does that, where does that end? Does that end in church? You guys used to say, say parents, uh, does it end at 17th and 5th, or does it go up to New Hope and Plymouth? <laughs> you know, where does it end? It should end in your home, in your bedroom, in your kitchen, when you're saying your prayers, at school, at work. That's what we want these kids to do, because not all of them are going to be choir directors. We want them to be able to go out and be good Christians and be Christ-like to their neighbors. But what works for one kid may not work for another. So be careful to presume that an announcement at the end of liturgy from Father saying, anybody that's interested in joining the choir can come up to the choir loft for rehearsal on Wednesday night. Okay, great. Check that one off my list. Okay, where is everybody? <laughs> <laughs> he made an announcement. You know? Unlike Larissa, who announced that there would be this session here, <laughs> parishioners don't usually work that way. They don't immediately jump in and run into the other room because you're going to have the choir rehearsal just because you're so it's, you've got to be sort of hands-on, you've got to be sort of one-on-one. -on -one. So take that initiative and find those people that are going to do that. And then work with your church school classes. Okay? So find the kids that are looking or show some interest. Let them get comfortable. Let them attend consistently. Become familiar with the services. And then turn to the people. Now, literally and figuratively, how many times do you meet a kid that shows up in the car loft or in the clear house and says, Oh, here, you stand up close, you can turn the pages. Now, how do you think they're going to know what's going on? <laughs> if this is their first time, again, uh, I'll tell a story about myself. I served in the altar all the time. All the time, so much so that when I actually went up into the car loft, I was like, 
they've got music for this stuff? <laughs> because in the altar, we just sang based on what we heard. You know, the oral tradition is completely alive. And I go up in the car off, and I look at Marianne, and I'm like, there's music. She's like, what do you think we've been singing? <laughs> and I'm like, I don't know. It just never dawned on me, you know? <laughs> because there was no music downstairs with the congregation, so why would there be music up in the car off? So, don't put your kids at the music stand. Let them have a buddy, an adult, but let them first become familiar with the service. Now, you notice the lengths of these bars and the placement, it's not, that's not for Microsoft graphics. If they take this long, this represents length of time. Okay? It could be a long time, it could be a short time. Let them get comfortable. Okay? You want to let them get comfortable, let them adopt themselves, let them be comfortable with the experience of singing with the choir. And then let them attend consistently. This may be a couple weeks, a couple months, a couple years. This may be a couple weeks, a couple months, a couple years, which reminds me I have to do so. Uh, let them become familiar with the services, which takes almost as long as this, because if they're not com comfortable with the services, and they're not familiar with the services, then how are we going to be able to ask them to turn the page? And they'll naturally do that. They'll eventually get to that point, and you'll know when it's ready, because they'll know what's going on, because they'll anticipate, because they'll kind of get through the next years. I have to show you this, because this is great. During the middle of Lent, our first grader decided she's working on her handwriting skills. And she wrote, I am going to sing every day. I like to sing now. <laughs> and it's like, okay. My wife and I looked at each other and said, well, that's good to know. But what's crazy about it is that she's six and she's been singing for as long as we can remember. This is the one who, when she was three, burst into tears after going to vigil for ascension with us because we told her she, that we weren't going to be singing Christ is Risen anymore. <laughs> but talk about Christ is risen. And so we sang a couple more weeks. But this year, you know, so now double the age, she's like, okay, so now we stop. What are we going to sing now? Okay, well, we'll sing the Ascension Trip Oh, okay. Oh, now we'll sing Pentecost Trip So we're trying to bring it into the home to help them sort of make that connection with the feast. You can also bring the feast into home by blessing fruit, blessing candles, all of you know, the various elements that are tangible that you can bring home. You can also do a birthday cake for the Nativity of Theopogos. You know, but don't tell the kids. You know, first you put the birthday cake out on the table. Whose birthday is it? Oh, it's the Virgin Mary. Now, if you went to vigil the night before, you probably already got the ball wrong. If not. Then it's talking about. Then the following year, you can start. Oh, September first, start the school year, start the new church year. Don't forget, next week's the birthday, birthday of the Virgin Mary. You pull out the icon and you sing the Trapari. You're singing it is truly me. And you sort of find these ways to make it tangible. And you put together lessons that you can send home with your church school kids so that they can then go home. And you befriend those parents and say, hey, I'm going to send this home. Maybe you want to try doing this. Stop at the store and buy a cake, pop a candle in there, don't have a number, and I'm not even going to try to guess how many years it is, but, you know. Basically, I propose that we create a series of lessons that we can all use, that we can work with, that we can refine, that we can share. If every single person in this room committed to, like, sharing an idea, and half of us in this room committed to actually putting together the workshop lessons, we could probably come up with enough for one month for an entire year, possibly even a year and a half, which then gives us a jump start on creating the next batch. Because once you do one, you do another one. And then you look at the other one, you come back and you reassess and say, hey, okay, that was good, but now we did this one, and this one, you know, let's change this around a little bit. Because if we can do something like that collectively, then just imagine what we can do back in our own area. Now, I'm not saying that we have time for this and we have to get better in the way, but it can be done over the course of time. It also means to go back home and talk to your church school coordinators and see what they're doing. I've been asked recently to help out with the diocese to put together some lessons for church school teachers. And I said, okay. I didn't say, what do you want? <laughs> so I actually said, okay, first. 
And then they said, great. And I said, well, what do you want? And they said, well, put together some lessons. So like, there, it's not like they already have something in mind that you have to fit into. You have to be sort of entrepreneurial and sort of self-motivated, which is where books like this come in handy, because there's ideas in here. Or there's stuff online. There are websites out there. There's probably blogs out there as well. But the beauty of what we have here as singers and directors and composers and just Orthodox Christians is that we have a singing culture in our faith. And if we have that singing culture, then just think about what we're singing and what we're saying in those words. Because then, you know, we can use that to come up with ideas. We can share our knowledge. Go back to that oral tradition. Okay. We're already in church, we already hear the music, but the kids already hear the music. It's just a matter of pulling it together. How are you doing? Well, I'm sure Alice can probably speak on this because she's got a lot of great resources, whether it's the psalm notes or the things that she shared back at the conference in Cicero, which I still have and have referenced, and it's great, and thank you. Can't thank you enough, and those that have done other resources that I've been able to pull together in reference. You start at the beginning. Give them a note. Love. See if they can match. If they can match, then okay, you've got somewhere to start. If they can't match, then figure out a way to get the majority of people on the same note. Once you do that, see if they can do a scale. Now, if you can't get them to do a scale without introducing the sound of music, <laughs> introduce the sound of music. Do, re, mi, fa, so, la, di, do. Once you do that, oh, I know that song, okay. If you don't want to do that, then twinkle, twinkle, little star, ba, ba, la, chi, have you any will, a, b, c, d, e, f, g. Suddenly you've got three different melodies, three different sets of lyrics for the same song. Which then can lead into, have you ever noticed how some of our chapari and our hymns use the same melodies but different words? Oh, Lord, save thy people, oh, Lord, when you were baptized in the Jordan, how many were chaparians, can we sing through the same melody? Except that's probably a better word. And they all laugh when you say that. It's like, oh, that wasn't even church word. That was kind of funny. So you break the ice with them. But, um, I forget who it was, but way, way, way back, Dave Drillock at St. Vlad, when they would do the conducting course, would pull out the New York Times, and you had to set the New York Times to a chaparian melody. Try doing that. Try having the kids do that. They'll learn how to sing without any music. They probably know a lot of the melodies already. Okay? But do the same their key. Ready? We'll try it out here, see if it works. I will receive the call of salvation. Here we go. I will receive the call of salvation. Playing with her doll, just going on and on and on, and 
And so I finally went over and I said, God, oh, what are you singing? She's like, well, I'm singing Christ is Risen. And I'm like, okay, we're sort of freaks. I understand that. We've done about 30 or 40 of them that we know all these different languages and the girls like to sing. And I'm like, I don't recognize that one. And I'm like, did you learn that one at church? She's like, no, it's my own. <laughs> and I'm like, wow. <laughs> is it like, what could you possibly say? And I said, well, can I hear it? <laughs> and so she sang it, and I'm like, i got to write this down. Because here she is, she's three, and she's made it her own. You know, it just brings tears to your eyes when you see something like that. And so I'm not brave, please. I'm not, uh, but I'm saying that your efforts can be rewarded in ways that you never imagine. And that's the point. God is so good to us that all we have to do is just put a little water on those seeds that are out there and help those kids. Because you don't know how they're going to react in the long run. It's so worthwhile because then when they give you a little sticky that says this, you can smile and say, okay, that's great, knowing full well that three years ago you were writing music. <laughs> you can't really pop that. Start with the scales, okay? And then add thirds. So I'm gonna break right here. So Bill, you're gonna go this way, and everybody else, okay, so do re mi fa so re and then I'm, you're gonna start on third. So we're gonna start with B, since we already know A. Here we go. Do re mi fa so re so You can do that with kids very easily. If you start with A, you do it two or three times, you get them all smile and say, hey, you guys are good enough to sing in the sound of music. You can very easily go to this by just cutting the room in half. If you've got older kids or kids that have sung before, you can do this with C, which is really cool. It sounds really great with kids, okay? It's a really nice sound. And then they start to hear the harmony, and then you say, all right, you've got some confidence, now let's go forward. And that's where you then, you can introduce something like this. And then you do the same echo. And then you put the music up, and they see it, and it's like, oh, that's what we were just singing. Because they recognize it now because they see the pattern. Or you get a little bit more complex, and you give them this and say, okay, now this half over here, you're going to sing the melody, this half over here, you're going to sing the top line, and you put it together. Because then you're able to encourage familiarity with the services because they're going to start recognizing those ideas. Okay? Then you start introducing those basics to the church. <coughs> What's going on with the current entrance? Use your surroundings. Why is that icon over here? What happens over here? Where do the deacons go? Where do the altar books go? Start finding things that they do. Well, what are we seeing when the deacon does this? They know a lot of the stuff already. It's just a matter of letting them know that here's why we're doing it. Older kids are going to be able to soak up a lot more, younger kids are going to be able to soak up a little bit less, but they're going to still get it. So talk to the ones that are sort of in the middle. Because you don't have, like, like I've only got another few minutes to talk with you and speak about these things and share these ideas. With the kids, you want to sort of hit towards the middle, because the little kids, they'll be sort of like, okay, they'll get every other word, and the older kids will be like, okay, yeah, I knew that, but you're reinforcing the ideas that they want, that they need, more importantly. Then, this, this may seem like it's upside down, but at this point, this is when I introduce the basics of music and what it means. See these curves and these lines and these things? This is what it means. You know, we didn't learn how to read from a book. We learned to read in the We didn't learn to speak English from a book. We learned to speak English from our parents. Same thing, we learned to sing from those that are around us. Then we can go back to this is what it means, and this is what we follow, and this is what we Okay. Then we get a resource to bring home. But how many? It's not that. <laughs> Small snippets. And what I've got over here are some things that I don't want to bring home. Okay. So I brought resources for, for all of you. Take what you want. I'm sorry I don't have a lot of copies, but I'm sure if there is anything. Um, we can make copies. We can make copies, or I can email it to you. I have um, no financial gain in any of this. <laughs> So I want to have you share it in, in a format that you can go in and use it and whatever else it may be. Orthodox prayers are great. You know? Give them the Trisagion. How many kids actually know the Trisagion? 
you would be scared to find out why you can't get to the Lord's Prayer. They can start with O Heavenly King, they can probably get to glory to the Father, but oh yeah, and the Lord's Prayer. So a lot of the basics need to be reinforced in time. Okay? <coughs> Once you do the basics, then you can give them basic settings of music. Here's the Lord's Prayer. Even if it's the most unharmonious experience at home and the parents don't sing, encourage them to do it because no one's going to hear you except God. Okay? The idea, again, is that it's your prayer you're offering. I thought what Kurt said yesterday was great. We're able to be created because we are created in the image and likeness of God. If that's the case, then our offering of prayer is our thanks and our gratitude, no matter how it sounds. We may be really good at writing, or we may be really good at making business decisions, or whatever else. Well, sort of take off all of those handcuffs, and I can't do it, and I don't sing, and just sort of do it. You know, Nike's got a great phrase, we can reuse it. Nobody, <laughs> nobody's going to like say that it's copyrighted, we can't say it. Just do it when we sing or pray at home. But encourage people to do it. There's so many different ways that we can connect people to the life of the church. But it all starts with Pascha. Pascha is that foundational piece, and then all these other ones loop around on top of it. Okay? Keep that Pascha joy. I was really tempted to come in here this morning and say, Christ is risen, just because I miss saying it. You know, 40 days of it, it's like, oh, I'm going to trouble. <laughs> so, but use those other elements. You know, we say, shine, shine, the, the, the priests says when he comes back into the altar after communion, shine, shine in New Jerusalem. Okay? In our prayers we say, oh heavenly king. Okay? In the Triodian we say by the waters of Babylon, which is already anticipation of Pascha, right? In the Nain and the Aptoikos, we've got those where we have our, our troll saints, or our family saints, if you're Serbian. And you think about what those saints did on behalf of Christ, God man incarnate. Okay? The Festival name, we've got all those feasts that we can and the sacraments. Take your kids to weddings. Take your kids to baptisms. If you teach church school or, or partner with your church school teachers and say, hey, there's a wedding on Sunday. Well, I think we should bring the eighth graders to the church for the wedding. Yeah, but it's more than we know. Yes, but these kids are going to get married. If their first wedding that they've ever been to is, is their own, what does that say? <laughs> Take your kids to baptisms so that they can hear the songs, so that they can see the services, so that they can understand what's going on, so that they, when they have questions, put together, actually I forgot to bring that up, you put together a pamphlet for funerals. Take your kids to funerals. I think, I think funerals are probably the worst services that we do here in the States. Why? Because it is, there's such a disconnect, I'm sorry, it's sort of a tangent, but we kind of have to talk about it, because it's one service that kids have to go to. They can get out of the funeral, or they can get out of the baptism, they can get out of the wedding, but eventually they're probably going to have to go to somebody's funeral. And they're going to stand there and they're going to watch the priest sense, you know, sense the, the, the deceased. And the choir's going to stand there and sing, and we just stand there in silence. And then we go home and have our cathartic experience at home. The service is supposed to be that cathartic experience. Just like the liturgy and all the rest of this. All of these moments that we have, we're supposed to come into church and be changed when we come up. So, and so, one of the things that I would love to work on, and if anybody wants to work on it with me, let me know, is to fix, especially the memorial service, the body and the process. Okay? Because the music is all there, it's just been so truncated, at least in the OCA, that it's your most refrains, hear most refrains, and it's like, just imagine if you heard those trapars in between. Just imagine if you, instead of so the choir director standing there directing those five people, turns and has everybody sing, give rest. Or on Pascha, depending on where you're standing, when they're singing the Irmo and the trapars, turns and everybody goes, Christ is risen from the dead. Just imagine the response you get. So think about the funeral in terms of kids and what we can do transform what we have as services. Here's that melody from my dog. Because this is what's possible. They'll pick it up and they'll make it their own. 
and you'll sit there and scribble it down in finale really quick. My best slide yet. <laughs> there we go. Um, kids are sharp. In essence, that's that's what it's on. Okay, kids are sharp. They're going to pick up on what we're doing. They're going to know when we're being honest and sincere and we're well intentioned. And they're also going to know that if we're there and we're stable and we're grounded and we have the best intentions, they'll be also very forgiving and they'll know that they'll be able to rely on you. More so probably than their parents. Because, you know, they're going to pick up on what's going on and if they see that this is important and this is in the circle here, then all these other things are going to be handled in relation to that. I told a couple of stories about our younger daughter, the old one. We were at church, Holy Saturday, we're very close to Alaska, and it's doing the rise of God, and, and the altar boys are going, and they're changing everything, and the crucifix that was over the tomb, on the back, is the resurrection that come. And so, the covers have changed to white, we're singing the rise of God, and, and everything is going great, and the cross gets turned around, and my wife is holding her on her arm, and suddenly she just goes, and she grabs my wife, her cheeks turns and Mommy, Jesus is alive! <laughs> and I'm like, like the whole choir just erupted in laughter, and it's like, well, okay, we're going to do that verse again. <laughs> but she got it. You know? They get it. And they did nothing on our part. They just pick it up. Now, what to avoid? <laughs> and what to do? Unrealistic expectations? Be realistic. So, pretty straightforward ideas here. A lot of stuff that I've covered so far. Be practical. This is a big one here. If you do something and you get it going the first year, don't be surprised after 87% participation the first year you come back and the first week you've got one kid. That's okay, because a sophomore slump is guaranteed to happen. But be realistic and say, okay, I gotta take a break, gotta try something different. They got they liked it last year, but now I've got to reinvent myself. So always think about what you can do, and that's where if Everybody in this room comes up with a couple ideas. So we'll use your idea this year. So flip it around and make sure we'll use yours. Remember, in September, we've got Nativity. We've got Elevation of the Cross. We've got North American Saints on the 24th. We've got other saints. So there's always different things we can use. This is a big one, too. Make sure your liturgy is joyous and dynamic. Okay? It could be really somber, really, oh, just a oh, great experience. <laughs> Kids aren't going to get that. Very few people are going to get that. They need something that's going to be just like all the adults. Look, I got soccer at 11. I got to be out of here. So give them a moment where it's like, oh, really? It's okay. It's 10 you know? Provide a setting which can be prayerful, which can be transformative for them and for you, be memorable, adopted, and shared. Because the girls that are in the choir right now are there because the other kids in the choir said, hey, I'm going to the choir. Yeah? Yeah, it's fun. Okay. One becomes <coughs> two, two becomes three, three becomes five. You never know how it's going to change. And remember the sowers. I said at the beginning, all we have to do is take care of the seeds that God's given us. If we do that, then May God bless us because this world needs help and we've got a lot to offer. Look at all these smiling faces. You haven't fallen asleep on me this information. <laughs> but you've got a lot of a lot of resources in the church that you can share and offer. And if we can get everybody's contact information at the end, which I'm sure that the nurse is already taken care of, and we come up with some ideas, maybe we set up a, a page that we can pool resources together. We put together a Skype chat and we say, hey, what are we going to do? Okay, so for September. Uh, okay. I, I, was, I Sorry, I did not want to talk the whole time, but. You did. I, I've got five minutes. I've got five minutes, so I can, I can say, I'm going to shut up now. <laughs> so, any questions? Anything that you want to share that your experiences would be great to pass along to other people here?